so that we free up some of the space for criminal uh, investigations to continue while we have you know a, a more specialized look at uh, um, issues of corruption and so on and so forth but the drill ship uh, issue is still alive and I'm sure that the Attorney General is looking at what areas you know they can build dockets and things it takes time these uh, things especially in a constitutional uh, government it takes time because everybody is innocent until proven uh, guilty and so we cannot be um, adherents of constitutional governance but be lovers of arbitrary justice people want me to arrest everybody who's been accused of a crime and lock him up because they did it in pndc i mean oh, pndc time would have locked them up yes would have locked them up but we didn't have a constitution then if we didn't have a constitution and i was a dictator i mean if you're accused of corruption i'll catch you and lock you up and then wait till you are proven guilty or innocent then release you but we cannot have a constitution we cannot eat our cake and have it people have to go through the process and the process is slow everybody knows even in civil cases you take a land case to the courts and it, this jida prosecutions started in 2012 we're in 2016 but i can't go and catch them and lock them up on the presumption that they are guilty the national service case how many years is it three years now people inserted ghost names in the national service payroll and creamed millions of ghana cities we've retrieved 40 million ghana cities from them some of them have you know pleaded guilty and offered a refund and so we've taken we've gotten back 40 million of taxpayers money but those that are under criminal prosecution has been going on for three years now and we just must have patience with the process because we cannot go back to unconstitutional governance and just arrest people and lock them up we've been there before and Ghanaians decided that we don't want to do that again this is the GBC Star Ghana Presidential Encounters 2016. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll take more questions from our audience. Do stay with us. My question. The people of Cape Coast are happy with what you have done so far. Uh, but my question is, uh, if when you are given the nod for the next four years, have you finished with Cape Coast? Are we going to get our own interchange uh, at the Peddy Junction to reduce the waiting time and the number of traffic accidents? Uh, will we get a dual carriage from the Peddy Junction to uh, the Ankafu Junction? I am in tourism. Are we also going to get an airport, a local airport, like what is going on in Ho? Right, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you very much. And we urge you uh, to allow more people to ask questions by just, don't be selfish, ask just one question. And so, um, yes, my good friend, go ahead. What's your name and uh, what do you want to ask the president? Uh, please, my name is Ofori Noako. I'm, I'm the, uh, the UNO chairman, GBC Cape Coast, and an HR person. I would like to know your personal plan for GBC staff, considering the fact that for some years now, because of the embargo on employment, we are not able to employ staff. Additionally, our condition of service and then uh, uh, the other conditions of uh, uh, performance are not all that encouraging. In your own uh, idea as the president of the country, if you happen to get the note for the next four years, what are you going to do personally for GBC staff? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll turn our attention now to the studio where uh, I'll give the mic to uh, our friend from the Federation of the Disabled. Then after that, we'll turn our attention to NUCS and the GJA. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Alexander Bamboli Williams, uh, lead member of the Communication and Elections team of the Federation. My question is, should you get a so, so, of Ghanaian? Sorry, one minute. Oh. Yes. My question is, should you get a nod of Ghanaians for the next four years? What do you intend to do by way of policy on employment to increase the employment rate of persons with disabilities in the formal and informal sectors from the current 3% to a minimum 8% within the next four years? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll give the mic to the GJA president now. My name is Afia Moni. I'm the president of GJA. Mr. President, what explains the chronic difficulty in passing the right information bill into law, which has been incubated for 13 good years. 
All right, thank you very much. Now, the National Union of Ghana Students, uh, the president is here. If I pass the mic to him. Thank you so much. My name is Julian Kobun. I'm the president of the National Union of Ghana Students. A lot of our colleagues defer their programs every year in the universities. And we believe that the SLT must be able to see them through school. But the problem with the SLTF is that in September, the problem what? with the SLTF system, SLTF, Student Loan Trust Fund system, oh, okay. Okay. is that you have to be able to register in school before you can even apply for it. So it means that if you don't have the money, you can't even register and be in school. Can central government, if you have a second term in offer, can central government work with the Vice Chancellor Ghana and the community of uh, private university managers such that um, you'll be allowed to register in universities so that in March when the money is up, the money is not paid to the individual, but it will be paid to the university as your school fees. So it will be a perfect response to them of the study federal program every year in school. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Silicon. Yeah. All right, Mr. President, we'll begin with the one from Cape Coast concerning um, tourism roads development for the people of Cape Coast. Yes. They don't want to be forgotten. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not done with Cape Coast, <laughs> and so uh, that's my answer to him. We've done a lot of work in, in, in Cape Coast, um, seeing that Cape Coast and actually Central Region is um, the uh, destination of choice when it comes to tourism in Ghana. And so if we uplift and improve facilities in Cape Coast, then it nears to the benefit of Ghana because tourism is one area where we can create a lot of jobs and we can also um, improve the income and grow our economy. And so that's an area that um, we are uh, looking at. So one of the things we're doing uh, in Cape Coast is, you know, resurfacing the roads nicely and marking them. We're putting street lights so that we light up the uh, uh, city. We're doing the road to uh, Kakum. We've given it on contract to do the road that goes to Kakum, to Kakum uh, uh, Park. We built a new stadium so that there are uh, sporting facilities there. We've re-engineered the central market, which was the Kotokraba market, and made it a very modern, beautiful uh, uh, market. And um, indeed, we're doing a lot of other things. We've set up the uh, Professor John Evans Atamil's presidential library in Cape Coast is next to the castle. And so people can both go and enjoy the presidential library as they go to enjoy the uh, uh, Cape Coast uh, castle. So a lot of work has gone on in Cape Coast and we'll continue to uh, do much, much work there. Um, we envision a small aerodrome in Cape Coast that can take tourists you know, uh, into Cape Coast and fly them back. And so it's one of the areas that has been designated to receive an aerodrome. An aerodrome is a mini airport and that allows small planes to come in so that little charters bring in tourists in, they go enjoy the castle, they have lunch, then there's a late afternoon flight bringing them back to the capital city or something. It's something Any indication that of when it is starting out? We started the whole airport. In Runway in the whole airport, that is phase one, is finished, and we're working on phase two. We're doing the WA airport. We're building, we're refurbishing the terminal to uh, create passenger arrival and waiting uh, areas so that commercial flights can begin into WA. So those were the first two that we started tackling. We've upgraded the Kumasi uh, airport, put in runway lights, navigational systems, and everything. We finished phase one of Tamale airport. And so Cape Coast is um, on the next leg. And then Upper East, Borgatanga, is also on the next leg. I know the Ghana Airport Company has plans for that. <clears throat> One of the good things we've done is a lot of these state-owned enterprises, we have allowed them to invest on their own. And so they're no longer borrowing of government's balance sheets. And so they have their own budget on their investment uh, uh, projects. And so I do know that they have programmed to do uh, an aerodrome in Cape Coast and in Borgatanga. They're also going to rehabilitate the Sunyani Airport and bring it up to speed so that commercial flights can go into Sunyani Airport. They're doing the Kumasi Airport. We're supposed to cut sword with Otun for, for the expansion of the Kumasi Airport. The intention is to allow sub-regional flights from West Africa to fly in and out of Kumasi. And so you can fly directly from Kumasi to Lagos or to Abuja or to Dakar rather than coming to Accra. And so that's uh, the short cutting we're going to do. We're going to lengthen the runway and we're going to build a new terminal so that sub regional flights can start from there. So Cape Coast um, is um, supposed to be on the program for um, a, a local airport.
The next one was on the conditions well. of service for GBC and the recruitment plan for, for, for GBC as well. Um, what, what, what happens is we have, and let me explain this carefully because a lot of people mis misunderstand. We're implementing a homegrown fiscal consolidation program. And in the homegrown fiscal consolidation program, which is a three-year program, we put a net freeze on employment into the public services. A net freeze does not mean that you're not recruiting, but you're recruiting as many people as are leaving. And so if 20,000 people are retiring from the public services this year, then it means that this year you are recruiting 20,000 people. The intention was not to increase the wage bill because we were trying to stabilize the economy. But the net freeze does not apply to health workers and uh, education workers. And so by putting the net freeze, it allowed us to bring in more teachers and more nurses because we realized that there were schools without teachers, there were hospitals without nurses and doctors and so on. So while we've held down public sector employment and made it net, we have increased the employment of teachers and health workers. So between um, uh, 2010 to 20 to date, we've seen the single biggest employment of teachers in the history of Ghana. 78,000 teachers have been employed during this period. And with health workers from 2013 to date, to 2016, we've employed 23,400 you know, uh, nurses. And so it means that we're increasing employment. But then when we say we have put a net freeze, it means you need to get financial clearance before you can um, uh, employ because we know how many people are retiring from the service so we know the quota so if there are 20,000 people and GBC says they want you know 200 workers judicial service say they want this local government service say they want this this say they want this we need to distribute it so that everybody gets you know exactly what they, they need so that's what we're doing um, with regards to the welfare of um, um, GBC workers. I empathize and um, I believe that it's not only GBC but many other public sector organizations. With the implementation of the single spine, we've tried to push up, you know, salaries and wages. And so we saw a significant bump up in salaries and wages. Indeed, it came to a stage where salaries and wages were consuming the bulk of all our tax revenues. And that's why we needed to ensure that we tamed you know, the, the growth of uh, the public wage, uh, the public sector wage uh, bill. And so the organization that is responsible for advising government on welfare and salaries and wages is the Fair Wages Commission. And so it is important for the staff of GBC, if they have a case that they are being shortchanged in respect of, you know, the single spine uh, policy implementation to make a case so that we can see whether they have a case for adjustment. But um, I empathize and probably I'll let them take a look and see what the issues are. I don't really know what the issues with regards to your salaries and wages are, but I can ask the fair wages to take a look and see if there's anything amiss that is creating a problem with your uh, salaries and wages. Right. Um, the question on um, increasing employment for persons with disability. Yes. Um, we have the laws in place that compel um, um, uh, employers to employ persons with disability. The problem is that we have not enforced uh, the law. Um, it's, it's not been enforced over the years for many reasons. You know, I cannot understand what exactly the reasons are, but um, because of the huge informal sector and all that, I believe that with the formal sector, especially with um, a lot of the businesses that are opening up in ICT industry and so on and so forth, we can begin to look at that quota and ensure that these people are doing it. I don't believe in following them with a, a, a police or this thing to see how many persons with disability have you employed. But I do believe that by giving them some incentives and inducements, we should be able to get them to self-comply either in terms of 
giving them some waivers in respect of their taxes, depending on how many persons of this, with disability they are employing. This is something that the Minister of Gender and Children has discussed with me, and it's my hope that we can do a stakeholder consultation and see how jointly we can ensure that more persons with disability are being employed. But then the first thing you need to ensure is that they do have the skills. And that's why under the Youth Employment Agency, we have taken an initial 5,000 persons with disability to train them in any profession of their choice so that at least they have the skills. And then we can insist that, well, you, they'll say we don't have this, uh, they don't have the skills. We'll say, yes, we have this database of persons who have been trained in ICT, they've been trained in this, and so you can employ out of that database. And so that's something that uh, we would... Uh, look at. Increasing the percentage when they're not even complying with the 3% and increasing it to 8% probably would not be make any real difference. It is how we encourage them to comply with the law that would be uh, much better. With regards to the Student Loan Trust, um, that was a very good question. We have recently not only enhanced the loan, we've increased it. I'm sure Nooks is aware. And then we've also introduced what we call the Student Loan Plus. Before you could access the student loan, you had to provide an uh, admission letter to show proof that you had been admitted and had become a student. And then when you become a student, then we uh, um, uh, start to pay you the loan. Now we have come up with Student Loan Plus that allows the student loan to give you money to pay your admission fee. People couldn't get the admission letters because they couldn't pay the admission fee. And so they couldn't become students to benefit from the student loan. So now you can apply for the student loan plus so that your admission fee is paid directly to the school and that makes you able to gain admission. And when you've ad uh, uh, been admitted and you register, then you are giving the uh, loan that is given to everybody else. And so that has been introduced. Aside from that, we've increased the level of the loan so that it's able to meet the uh, circumstances of the students. The thing about the student loan is you borrow while you're a student. We don't take the loan back from you until you find a job. If you find a job, then it's deducted a little over time until they're able to claw it back and then give it to your younger brother who is coming after you or your child, you know, who would also come and benefit from it. And so that is how it is uh, structured. Um, the question had to do with the Right to Information Bill. Why the delays? Indeed, it will go down in history as the longest bill <laughs> that <laughs> ever was. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It started from when I was Deputy Minister of Communications. I remember we held round stakeholders, uh, round tables and all that on the Right to Information Bill. I became Minister. We worked on it. By the time I left as minister, we had a draft bill. But people had differences. Somebody said it has too many exemptions. Somebody says it has too little exemptions. Then I left government and went into opposition. And even in opposition, they were inviting us to stakeholders, trying to fine tune the bill and all that. Finally, under my mentor and comrade, Professor Tamil's of blessed memory, we presented the bill to Parliament. Once you present a bill to Parliament, it becomes the property of Parliament. I am in the executive. It's before some committee, they said they'll go around the country. They've gone around the country. They said they need more stakeholder consultation. Um, I feel, I don't know. <laughs> because we have, we, we have separation of powers. Parliament is autonomous. I cannot go and force them to pass it. But I have been, you've heard me advocate it and saying that they should pass the bill. It's been too long. Instead of the nation addresses, I've referred to that bill. And I've said, I don't know why it takes so long in parliament. We thought it was going to be passed in the last parliament. I don't know what happened. So I beg you, maybe <laughs> they'll be back in December. <laughs> <So> <laughs> probably will form a joint consultative team and go to Parliament and ask what the problem with passing the bill is. I can live with that bill. I don't know. My government has nothing to hide. And I believe that that transparency would help us. 
If somebody wants information, give it to them. It is a lack of information that fills the space with all these speculations and, you know, now social media has come. There are all kinds of misinformation. Somebody has stolen this money, this, with absolutely no shred of uh, a basis to it. Right. Right. And so if we had the right of information bill, you guys can ask for that information and you'll be given that information. Excellency, if I may, uh, two quick follow-up questions. Um, following up on the issue of the uh, right to information bill, uh, majority of the ministers that you have appointed are also uh, in parliament. Haven't you had time to ask any of them at all why this bill has delayed? That's number one. Number two, Your Excellency, uh, following up again on the issue of uh, student financing, um, you withdrew allowances for nursing trainees and then you have retreated on that decision why okay thank you very much um i don't know about asking my ministers who are members of parliament i mean that would not be the way to go and i believe that afl should ask for an audience with the speaker the gja should ask for an audience with the speaker and ask why what the difficulty is you actually met him. yes you and yeah, so I'm sure he would have explained to yeah, you. That they would pass it before rising. I also had the information that it would be passed before they rose. And so I don't know why it wasn't passed. So we should still find out, you know, why it, it has delayed that long. Um, with regards to, let me explain once again, and I hope for the last time. Teacher trainee allowances, nursing uh, trainee allowances. Teacher trainee allowances for reasons of equity. They used to be training colleges, and they used to issue set A and set B teacher training certificates. We decided that these colleges should be upgraded to colleges of education and become universities and issue degrees like Cape Coast, like Winneba, and all. We did that, and we upgraded them. And so they come out with the same certificate that their colleagues in Cape Coast and Winneba and Legon come out with. But because we were paying trainee allowances when it was teacher set A and B, at that time, we were not producing enough graduate teachers, and we had a lot of people teachers in the system. Everybody wanted to go to safe form and go to university. Nobody wanted to go to training colleges. So we introduced trainee allowances to entice people to come into training colleges. That is why it was introduced. Now we've upgraded them. They are universities. And so people are going to Cape Coast, people are going to the colleges of education to get university degrees to become professional graduate teachers. And you're paying one group trainee allowances, and one group you say, no, you go and take student loans. It, it doesn't make for equity. That's the first uh, issue. And the second issue is, as the numbers increased, you understand, it became a burden on the budget. And so they issued what they call the quota. And so each college was giving the number of people it could admit that the budget could sustain the trainee allowances. And so all the colleges were half empty. And if we want to accelerate the training of teachers to replace so that we don't have untrained teachers teaching our children, then we need to fill those colleges. And so we said, okay, now that these are colleges of education, let's take the trainee allowances away, one for equity, so that they are at par with their colleagues, and give them student loans. You don't pay the loan until you get a job as a teacher. And then fill up the vacancies. And so since we took away the trading allowances and replace them with the student loan. We have increased enrollment into the colleges of education by 63%. It means that 63% of the students who are there today and angry about student uh, 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 teacher training allowances will not be there if we're still paying training allowances. And so it gives more people the opportunity to be trained. It makes us train more teachers so that we can take out all the untrained teachers in the system and be able to post uh, qualified teachers into our schools. That is the explanation about teacher training allowances. With nursing training allowances, we decided that we're going to migrate them to onto student loan. And so we, we drew we were to withdraw the uh, nursing trainee allowances. But this even, it's not a policy that started. It came from the previous administration uh, in 2008. There's a management letter they wrote saying that they were going to withdraw nursing training allowances and use the funds instead to ensure that they created more opportunities for nurses to be uh, employed. And so when we came, that policy had been indicated for the budget of that year, but we didn't start implementing. 
we looked at it and said, okay, let's move them onto a student uh, uh, loan. Then our attention was drawn that they don't qualify because the Student Loan Act does not allow you to put nursing uh, uh, trainees on student loan. And so we set up a committee to look at it. And the committee said, okay, amend the law so that you can put them on student loan. But while you're amending the law, give them an abated allowance so that they're able to look after themselves while you go through the process. And so based on the committee's recommendation, we said, okay, pay them an abated allowance. And so they're being paid an abated allowance, not at the level they used to receive in the past, but a lower uh, allowance so that they're able to make ends meet until we amend the student loan trust law to, to accommodate them. That's the explanation. Right. Thank you very I hope much. that everybody has heard for the last time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Your Excellency.